years ago, before the divorce and the desk job, I worked as a fishing guide down in the Everglades. Tourists, mostly, looking to brag about catching a snook or a tarpon. Out there, the rhythm of life changes. The relentless sun beating down, the rustle of sawgrass, the hum of insects that feels woven into the very air. Something about the place seeps into your bones whether you want it to or not. My name's Wyatt. This one trip started out like any other. Client was a wealthy businessman type, more interested in showing off his fancy gear than the actual fishing. We were poling along a narrow channel, the mangrove roots like knotted fingers, when I spotted it. A flash of white, way off in the shadows. What's that? The client squinted, nearly toppling his expensive sunglasses into the brackish water. Beats me, I shrugged. Best way to pique a fisherman's interest is to act like you don't care. Figured it might be a rare bird, the kind that gets those binocular folks excited. We eased the skiff closer. Then I saw, it wasn't a bird, it was bones. A massive pile rising from the muddy bank. The client made a gagging noise. Even up close, the thing was unsettling. Not like any animal skeleton I'd ever seen. Pieces mismatched, the skull long and narrow like a gator but wrong, and all of it bleached bone white in the glaring sun. Worse was the feeling. That ain't natural out there. There's a rightness to predator and prey, life and death. This... It felt twisted, a violation of the swamp's own rules. But the client... Greed flashing in his eyes, insisted we get closer. Treasure, he muttered. Ivory, maybe. Worth a fortune. Before I could argue, he was scrambling onto the bank, scrambling toward that pile of bones with a manic energy that set my teeth on edge. I half expected the ground to open up and swallow him whole. Then the buzzing started. It was low and vibratory, like a bee the size of an eagle. Looked around, figured it was a gator growling, or maybe a nest of wasps disturbed by this fool's intrusion. But there was nothing visible. The client was clutching at his ears, whimpering something about the pain. Then, right in front of the boat, a shape flickered into existence. It was tall, head brushing the low hanging branches. Stretched, impossibly thin skin pulled taut over a skeletal frame. Where its face should have been, there was a bleached skull and empty eye sockets that seemed to burn even in the harsh sunlight. It raised a clawed hand, the bones like dirty sticks bound with sinew, and the vibratory buzz swelled to a deafening roar. Gun! I yelled, fumbling beneath the seat. My client was gibbering in terror, hands plastered to that buzzing skull. The creature lunged, its movement not a run but a sickening series of jerky twitches. I fired off a shot, more of a desperate reaction than any tactical sense. The bullet went right through its chest, no reaction at all. The client screamed as skeletal fingers closed around his throat. I fired again, right at the skull head. Its jaw snapped open in a silent hiss, and those empty sockets flared with a cold, furious light. It wrenched my client out of the boat with impossible strength, disappearing into the mangroves with its thrashing, screaming prey. The vibration cut off, and the silence roared in my ears. Don't know how long I drifted before another fishing boat spotted me, shell-shocked, half-drowned, and babbling something about a bone monster. Naturally, they thought I was drunk or sun-addled. Lost my guide license, client vanished without a trace, and wife Connie saw the final nail in the coffin of our marriage. Took a job in the Everglades National Park gift shop instead, ringing up postcards of sunsets and stuffed alligator plushies for day trippers. At night, that's when it gets bad. The dreams of sawgrass and mud, the buzzing loud as a freight train in my skull, and the stink of rot like something crawled up inside me and died. I see flickers of movement out of the corner of my eye, always that stark white against the shadows. Some nights, I think about getting a boat and heading back out there. Track the thing down, settle the score, even if it's the last damn thing I do. 
because stories folks tell around here, stories about old bone walkers that steal more than just lives, about folks gone missing after seeing something they shouldn't have. It makes me wonder if my client isn't dangling from some grisly altar in the heart of the swamp even now. And it makes me worry that one day, they'll be hanging another set of bones beside him. Mine. But there's another part of me, a creeping dread under the rage, that wonders if worse fates exist out there. After all, a bone walker needs more than just decoration for its lair. Couple years back, when on one of those boardwalk trails they set up for tourists, some city slicker kid, all wide eyes and gap teeth, points into the brush and yells, Look! At first I figured it was some ibis or a heron, the usual swamp fare. But when I followed his finger, my blood ran cold. There, half concealed by the sawgrass, was a figure. Thin, impossibly thin, with hunched shoulders and a head that lolled on a too long neck. Even at a distance, there was something wrong with the way it moved, jerky and unnatural. The kid was oblivious, but I saw it clear as day. That stark white skin, the glinting hollows where eyes should have been. For a heartbeat, the creature turned its head, as if sensing my gaze across the distance. The buzzing started then, faint but unmistakable. I grabbed the kid, didn't say a word, just hustled him back to the safety of the boardwalk. Let his parents fuss over their brave little explorer while I stifled a scream. Nobody would have believed me anyway. Sometimes, ignorance is a mercy. Sometimes, it's the only thing keeping you alive. And lately, as the buzzing gets louder and the flickers of white grow bolder, I'm less and less sure which side of the line I'm on. The Everglades is a harsh mistress, beautiful and terrible in equal measure. And some things that slither and crawl and buzz in those shadows, they're better left undisturbed. Maybe one day, I won't have the strength to run anymore. Maybe that bone walker will finally catch me. But if it does, it'll find I'm tougher than any fancy businessman, and I won't go down without leaving bite marks on its skeletal shins. It happened down in the Everglades a few years back. Me and a few buddies decided a camping trip was just what we needed. A bit of nature, you know. Leave the city life behind for a while. I'm Wes, by the way. Always been the cautious type in the group. The one they make hold the car keys on bar nights. Should have listened to my instincts this time, too. We rented this cabin off an older guy. Said he'd built it himself on an island out in the swamp. Place was tiny, barely fit the four of us in it but it had a dock with a rowboat, so that was something. First day went by without a hitch, mostly fishing and grilling. Place was so remote, all we heard was the birds and mosquitoes buzzing us. Which, okay, maybe wasn't so relaxing after all. Then Ethan. Big, dumb, lovable Ethan. The kind of guy you want on your side in a fight but don't want planning your weekend trip gets this brilliant idea. Nighttime gator hunting. He announces after a few too many beers. Says they'll be easy to spot with flashlights, that we can snag them off the shore with a rope if we're lucky. Now, my natural inclination was to tell him he was insane. Those things got teeth, and I got student loans to pay off. But the others, they were all hyped up on the idea. That primal man versus nature nonsense. So, like an idiot, I went along with it. We piled into the rowboat, me manning the oars while those bozos shone their flashlights into the murky water. The place looked different at night. The trees seemed to lean in, their branches like twisted fingers reaching out for us. The water was black, hiding whatever critters lurked below. That's when the smell hit us, rotting meat, thick and sickly. Ethan choked, waving a hand in front of his nose. Suddenly, the gator hunt didn't seem so appealing anymore. Then Trevor, whose eyesight ain't always been the best, pointed his light at the shore. There was a body there. We stared in horror. It was half-submerged in the reeds, so bloated it looked fake. 
but the worst was how it was mangled, like some giant animal had torn into it with claws. I started rowing away, couldn't get back to that cabin fast enough. Nobody said much, an unspoken agreement to forget whatever the hell we'd just seen. We didn't sleep well that night. I kept hearing things outside, rustling sounds, once a low growl like a dog, but deeper and rougher. The rest of the guys had gotten skittish too, blaming the noises on each other, trying to laugh it off. But none of us believed it. Morning came and we were all set to bail. Ethan, ever the optimist, decided to check his fishing lines one last time. Figured he might get a good breakfast out of it at least. The rest of us hung back, not feeling up to being on the water again. Maybe a minute passed before we heard him scream. We took off running in the direction of the dock, hearts pounding. I got there first and, well, I won't go into the gory details. Let's just say the things that attacked him weren't gators, and whatever they were, they were hungry. We didn't even try the boat after that, just bolted through the swamp, half blind with fear. I scraped my leg up something fierce on a cypress root, and Dylan twisted his ankle, but we kept on. Behind us, I swore I could hear it lumbering after us, that long, lanky body crashing through the underbrush getting closer. We finally saw the ranger station around midday, burst in there babbling about our friends and monsters, looking like lunatics. The ranger, bless his heart, didn't even laugh, just nodded grimly and told us to stay put while he called in some reinforcements. A helicopter came for us in the end. They found Dylan too, eventually. What was left of him, at least. They never found a trace of Ethan, or a good explanation for whatever was out there. Park officials played it off as a bear attack, but the old ranger, he looked at me with that knowing glint in his eye. Turns out there's some old stories, tales they don't advertise to the tourists. Legends of a creature, a thing born out of hunger in the deep swamp, something they call a wendigo. They say it stalks those unlucky enough to wander too far in after dark. I moved out of Florida after that. Mountains now. Plenty of solid ground and noisy cities as far as the eye can see. I still get the nightmares sometimes, dreaming of those empty, hungry eyes and that insatiable rotting smell. I sleep with all the lights on, and every time I hear a twig snap outside my window, I remember Ethan's scream echoing through the swamp. It changes a man, seeing your buddies die like that. It makes a coward out of even the bravest of us. It happened a few years back, on a trip down south. Not much of a vacation guy, more a stay-home-and-do-some-yard-work type, but sometimes your friends convince you to do some dumb stuff. Like, for instance renting a fishing boat on the edge of the Everglades. Name's Wyatt, by the way. This friend of mine, Jasper, was all gung-ho about exploring the real swamp. I got dragged along more often than not, mostly as the voice of reason, or at least the guy who packed extra snacks and a decent first aid kit. Everglades ain't like your usual weekend fishing spot. That much was obvious. The whole place feels different, the air heavy and still, Trees dripping with that Spanish moss thing. Gives a guy the creeps. First day out went by without much incident. If you don't count the sunburn and the whining from Jasper that we weren't catching anything. By nightfall, I was ready to call it quits. That's when Jasper got his bright idea. Night fishing was the way to go, he says. That's when the catfish got big and hungry. Now... Even someone as generally easygoing as me knows that's a dumb idea. Gators, snakes, who knows what else lurks around in a swamp after dark. But did I argue? Nope. Like an idiot, I went along with it. Figured maybe I could convince him to head back in after an hour or so. We set out with some lanterns and a bucket of bait. Jasper rowed us down one of those narrow channels, deeper into the swamp. The darkness seemed to press in with the night fog, turning the whole world into shades of gray and black. Sounds were different at night, too. Rustling noises in the trees, 
those glowing gator eyes watching us from the bank, the rhythmic splash of the oars cutting through the water. With every splash, every ripple, I had this creeping feeling that something big was lurking down in the dark depths, just waiting for us to make a wrong move. Turns out, catfish are less into biting when there's a bunch of other critters out and about. Jasper was cursing, and even I was starting to get uneasy. Every shadow flickering at the edge of the lantern light made me jump. That's when the smell hit. Something rotten, mixed with an acrid tang, like burning. My stomach turned. Beside me, Jasper had gone stiff, not from catching a fish, but from something behind me. He pointed a shaking finger. At the far edge of the lantern light, something moved, tall and gangly with skin hanging loose like a half-deflated balloon. Its head was too small, the jaw stretched too long, and the mouth... The mouth dripped with something dark and sticky. But the eyes... Those were the worst. Just black pits in the moonlight, staring right at us. For a frozen second, we just watched it watch us. Then it turned and stalked off into the shadows, melting into the darkness from which it came. Its footsteps made a squishy sound as they faded into the night. I don't know how long I stared at that spot, but eventually I gagged, the putrid smell overwhelming. Even Jasper was pale, his bravado gone. We didn't talk much on the row back, both of us lost in the same horrifying thought. What the hell was that? We'd both seen it clear as day, no mistaking it for a bear or some deformed gator. Whatever it was, it looked... hungry. We hightailed it out of those swamps the next morning. I convinced Jasper to cut our trip short, figuring that was the end of it. Bad dreams fade over time, right? Wrong. Sometimes bad experiences stick with you. Nightmares would wake me up in a cold sweat, seeing those empty pits of eyes gleaming in the dark. The smell, that rotten, burning thing, would drift back to me on the wind sometimes, setting my teeth on edge. I got jumpy. Couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched, even in the middle of a crowded city street. Started researching, digging through backwoods stories and old legends. Turns out, those swamps, they have a history the tourist brochures don't mention. They talk about a creature that haunts the shadows, gaunt and twisted with an unending hunger. They call it a Wendigo. The more I read, the more the pieces fit. That tall, emaciated shape, the insatiable hunger radiating from it in waves. It matched those old tales too well to be a coincidence. And then there was Jasper. He never resurfaced after that trip. Search party turned up his empty boat, some slashed-up fishing gear, but no sign of him. Don't know for sure what got him. A bear, a gator, or something else. What I do know is... Some legends have teeth, some shadows you never fully outrun. Moved up north after that, to a tiny mountain town with plenty of dry land to keep me grounded. Thought maybe the clear air and open spaces would clear my head. Mostly, it worked. The nightmares became less frequent. The lurking paranoia faded to a background hum of unease. Still, the nights get to me sometimes. I leave a light on, maybe check the window once or twice the old swamp fear creeping back in. They found a body in the Everglades last week, another missing hiker, a college kid who'd wandered off the marked trails, drawn by the allure of the wild, I guess. Reading the news, I couldn't shake the image of that lanky, too tall figure, the stretched, grinning mouth. They'll blame it on an animal attack, maybe a bear or a panther, but I know better. The stories... The whispers, they have an uncomfortable ring of truth. Those old legends about a monstrous spirit born from famine, they say it's driven by a craving that can never be sated. They say its territory reaches far beyond what the maps show, stretching its long shadow across the land. I look outside my window at the moonlit peaks, and I can't help but wonder. Up here, surrounded by solid ground, I should be safe, shouldn't I? The mountains, they feel old, sturdy, untouched by the rot festering in those southern swamps. 
And yet, there's a rustling in the woods outside, the snap of a twig under an unseen weight. My heart stutters. I tell myself it's the wind, perhaps a deer foraging at the edge of the clearing. But as I squint into the darkness, a prickle of dread dances down my spine. There, at the edge of the tree line, I swear I see the flicker of two empty eyes staring back at me, reflecting the faint moonlight. In that moment, I know. The Wendigo is still out there, and it's always hungry. There's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide from a legend that's woven into the very land itself. It happened years back, when I worked as a biologist down at Corkscrew Swamp Sanctuary. I'm Miles, by the way. Not born and bred Florida, but got hooked on the ecosystem way back in college. There's something about the swamp, the stillness, the tangled beauty of it, that gets under your skin. This particular day started like any other. I was out on a field survey, cataloging waterbird populations, routine stuff. Binoculars, notebook, waders for when things got too mucky to walk proper. The midday sun beat down, turning the air thick and heavy, insects buzzing like a bad case of tinnitus. Around mid-afternoon, I reached the edge of a cypress dome. These are like little raised islands in the swamp, trees and ferns and whatnot growing on mounds of built-up peat. Most have a pool of water at their heart, still and tannin-stained. Perfect snake territory, which meant I wasn't taking any chances. Before entering the dome, I paused at the base of a sprawling cypress, taking a long drink from my canteen. Something, instinct maybe, made me scan the pool ahead, even though it was choked with lily pads and half hidden by twisted roots. A ripple disturbed the water's surface. My reflexes said gator, and I had my hand on my sidearm before the thought fully formed. Then, a flicker of movement in the far corner of the pool, behind a cluster of gnarled branches. It was dark, a long stretch of something, but the angle was bad and the water was throwing off the light. Too big for any snake I knew of, unless we'd somehow stumbled across some record-breaker python. Heart-pounding, I eased myself into a crouch, trying to get a better look without stepping into view. Then it moved again, and a piece of the puzzle clicked into place. Not a snake. An arm. A human arm, far as I could tell, ending in a long-fingered hand that raked at the surface of the water, dragging something heavy and wet. I yelled, loud, probably startled half the bird life in the sanctuary. Figured maybe it was a hunter who got lost, or swamp poachers up to no good. Whatever or whoever it was, my shout did the trick. Movement stopped behind those branches. Silence fell, except for the drip of water and the rising hum of mosquitoes. Hello? Anyone there? I called out, trying to project authority despite the tremor in my voice. No answer. I gripped my sidearm a little tighter. If it was someone trying to hide illegal activity, best to have the advantage. I took a slow, deliberate step forward forcing myself not to rush in. The smell hit me then, right in the gut. Rotting meat, swamp water, and something else I couldn't place. A sharp tang like bad milk. Strong enough to make me gag. Whatever was around the corner, it wasn't friendly. I inched toward the roots, gun raised now, every sense screaming at me to turn and run. That feeling somewhere in your lizard brain that tells you you're prey, not predator. Then it came into view. Not a person, not entirely. A hulking shape hunched on its haunches, shoulders broader than any man's. Its skin was pale, near translucent, slick with water, stretched tight over bulging muscles. Its head was long, tapered, and dominated by a mouth full of needle-like teeth. And those eyes, yellow, pupilless, staring right at me with cold, reptilian intelligence. I don't remember firing my gun. More of a reactive spasm than a conscious choice. 
The sound echoed like thunder in the stillness, and the thing snarled, a raspy hiss that cut through me worse than any gunshot. But it didn't fall. It scrambled back, moving with unholy speed for its size, and vanished into the tangle of roots. Splashes and cracking branches told me it was retreating into the deeper swamp. I didn't follow. Stood there, legs shaking, trying to catch my breath and convince myself I hadn't just hallucinated the damn thing. There were shell casings scattered around my feet, proof enough. And the smell, lingering like a foul stain on the air. I hightailed it out of there, stumbled back to the sanctuary headquarters, and spouted some half-crazed story to my supervisor. Figured they'd laugh, maybe put me on stress leave for a while. I didn't even care. What I got instead was silence. My supervisor, a woman tougher than tree bark, went white as a sheet. Then she got a look in her eye I'd only seen once before, after that python turned up dead with a whole deer in its belly. A look that said it was time to hunt. Turns out, there were stories, whispers, hushed conversations among the old hunters and guides who knew the swamp better than their own backyards. Stories about a creature, not gator, not bear. Something that took and never gave back. The old-timers called it a swamp boogeyman, something to scare greenhorns with. Turns out, those greenhorns had been seeing things too. Glimpses just out of sight. That same stink of rot. We didn't go in blind. My supervisor, Gwen, called in a favor from an old friend. Retired special forces who knew a thing or two about tracking predators, human and otherwise. Walt was his name, grizzled and taciturn in a way that screamed, seen too much. He looked at me, this young biologist with his shaking hands and book smarts, and didn't laugh. Just gave me a nod and a grunt. We spent two days prepping, not just gear, but mindset. Walt was big on that. You think like prey, you die like prey. He'd rasp, voice laced with wood smoke and something older. He taught me how to move silent, how to read the subtle signs of passage most folks miss, how to turn that bone-deep fear into focused energy. Then we headed back to that cypress dome. No waders and binoculars this time. We were armed to the teeth. Shotguns loaded with heavy buckshot and machetes strapped to our packs in case it got up close and personal. Gwen insisted on coming, refused to be left in the safety of the headquarters. If this thing was taking people, it was her problem as much as anyone's. We found the place where I'd seen it. Disturbed earth, spatters of blood on broad leaves, something dragged into the thicker undergrowth. Stank worse than ever, a heady mix of decay and musk. Walt took the lead, tracking the trail deeper into the swamp. He moved like a ghost, massive frame, silent despite the gear. Gwen and I followed, nerves strung tight as piano wire. The trail wound through sawgrass and strangler fig roots, twisting into darker, older parts of the swamp, where the cypress trees dwarfed us and sunlight barely pierced the canopy. The stench intensified, making my stomach churn. Then we found it. Not the creature itself, but its lair, I suppose. A clearing where the ground was churned to mud, littered with bones, animal and sickeningly human. A pile of ragged clothing lay there too, damp and stained with a dark brown that could only be old blood. Walt swore, low and vicious. Gwen went even paler, if it were possible. The thing wasn't just hunting for food, it was collecting. There had to be more victims, people who vanished without a trace. Their scent washed away by swamp water before the search parties ever arrived. That's when we heard it. A rustling in the trees, branches snapping. We spun, guns raised. It circled us, never fully stepping into the clearing. Glimpses of scaled hide, the flicker of those reptilian eyes between thick tangles of vine. It was smart, testing us, playing with its food. Walt didn't hesitate. He raised his shotgun, fired. The blast echoed through the swamp, and the creature roared, 
a bone-jarring bellow that wasn't quite animal. I fired too, more out of panic than aim, and Gwen emptied her revolver into the undergrowth. The rustling intensified, and then it retreated, slinking away into the labyrinth of roots and brackish water. We stood there, chests heaving, the adrenaline rush making my hands shake. We'd hit it, I was sure of that. But we hadn't killed it, not by a long shot. Back at the sanctuary, chaos reigned. Emergency calls, rangers mobilizing, a full-scale search-and-rescue effort kicking off. Me. I was put in a separate room and questioned. Witness statements, psychological evaluations, the whole nine yards. They couldn't wrap their heads around it. A creature that defied classification, that shattered the rules of what was supposed to exist in a modern national preserve. Walt vanished back into the swamp that night, wouldn't be restrained. Said it was a personal matter now. Gwen watched him go, tight-lipped. Knew, I think, that he wouldn't come back alone. Or maybe wouldn't come back at all. The aftermath. Well, it's still unfolding. They found more bodies, deeper in. Search parties reported movement in the trees, always out of reach. Swamp tours were suspended, warnings went out, but locals whisper it's not enough. Some talk of draining the area, burning it out. Utter madness. The swamp is older than all of us, holds things we'll never fully understand. Me, I got transferred. Desk job now, far from the tangle of cypress and the still dark water. Most days, I can convince myself it was a fever dream, stress-induced hallucination. Then I catch a whiff of something foul and remember the glint of those eyes. Nights are the worst. I dream of the swamp, of teeth flashing in the darkness, of the stink of rot and the sound of something vast, something hungry, moving unseen beneath the surface of the world. They say the locals down there still call it the Swamp Boogeyman, but they don't laugh anymore when they do. Happened years ago, back when I was a fishing guide up in the northeast part of Everglades National Park. Grew up in Homestead. Daddy ran an airboat tour operation, so I learned the waterways like the lines on my own hand. Name's Eli. Taking folks out on fishing trips, showing them the glades. It was my whole life, till that day. We were poling along the edge of a mangrove island. Client was a businessman from up north, all fancy gear and no patience. Kept complaining about the heat and the bugs. Wouldn't be still for a damn second. Not the type of guy I usually take out, but the money was good, so I grit my teeth and smiled. Sun was blazing overhead as we rounded a bend. Up ahead, a big gator was sunning itself on a half-submerged log. Nothing unusual, but Mr. Fancy Gear went nuts, yelling about wanting a picture. Figured humoring him would be the fastest way to shut him up pulled the boat closer to the log. Gator opened its eyes, and that's when I noticed something was off. Its snout was too long, its body oddly proportioned, too tall on the legs almost, and its eyes. They were green, not the usual yellow. Warning bells went off in my head, but before I could back us off, the client shrieked, practically jumped out of the boat. He went sprawling into the waist-deep water with a splash. The log moved. It wasn't a gator. It was something else. Something that had been camouflaged to look like a gator. Massive head, longer than my torso, rose from the water on a thick, sinuous neck. Scales glinted like tarnished copper. A mouth full of serrated teeth gaped open. No gator I'd ever seen looked like that. Terror shot through me. Hot, then cold. Get back in the boat! I yelled at the client. He stared, face gone white, then started splashing back toward me, yelling like a stuck pig. The creature lunged, water churned, and for one horrifying moment, I thought it had him, but he scrambled onto the boat. I grabbed the push pole, shoved us backwards as hard I could manage. The creature twisted, 
splashing and hissing in frustration, those terrible eyes fixing on us. Then, abruptly as it had come, it sank back below the surface. We drifted in the silence, both of us panting, Mr. Fancy Gear whimpering now instead of yelling. Finally, I got my brain back in gear, shoved the pole down and got us the hell out of there. Didn't say a word to the client about what we saw. When we got back to the landing, he was shaking, ranting about suing me, about how I'd staged the whole thing to scare him, shoved his money at me and stormed off. I was almost too freaked out to care. Almost. Then I thought of the money, of the rent on my trailer coming due, and I figured there are worse things than being called a liar. Didn't go back out that day. Went to a roadside bar and started drinking. An old Mikosuke fella sat a few stools down, watching me, then slid me an ice-cold beer. Said, his voice rough as old bark, You saw the stilt walker out there, boy. My blood ran cold. Stilt walker? I choked out. He nodded. Old thing. Some say it ain't natural. Best leave it be. Finished his beer and left. Didn't sleep much that night. Couldn't shake the image of that monstrous head, those teeth. So close. Next morning, I went back to the landing. Didn't rightly know what else to do. Figured there'd be someone else there from the park service, someone wanting a report. Wanted to scream at them about letting tourists roam around unprotected, about that thing out there. Landing was empty, no sign of rangers, no other airboats, no cars in the lot. An abandoned cooler sat on the dock. Something felt really wrong then, a prickle at the back of my neck that I'd learned not to ignore. Pulled out my cell phone to call the park hotline. No signal. Started to panic then. Figured I'd run my boat back to civilization, but when I turned, it was gone. My airboat simply vanished. Then I saw the footprints. Not human. Too big, the toes splayed wide in the mud, led from the water right on up toward the main road. Dread settled in my gut like a stone. No choice but to follow the tracks. They wound alongside the road for what seemed like miles, hot sun beating down. Finally, I saw it up ahead, a county sheriff's car smashed up against a tree. Doors were open, blood smeared the windshield, and beside the car, a body, was the ranger on duty for this section. Recognized him even in the state he was in, half-eaten, like something huge had ripped into him. That's when I ran, left the tracks ran blind into the sawgrass and scrub, kept running till I collapsed, heart fit to burst, never looked back to see if anything was following, hid out for hours until the swamp mosquitoes got so bad I thought I'd lose my mind. Finally, as the sun set, I crept back to the main highway, flagged down a passing car, family on vacation. Didn't even try to explain, just sobbed about needing to get to the police. The looks they gave me. They must have thought I was some escaped convict, or high on something. Investigation. Months of questioning. Park Service claimed no knowledge of any other missing folks. No unusual animal reports. They looked at me like I was crazy. After a while, I started to doubt myself. Never went back to guiding in the Everglades. Took a job driving a delivery truck upstate. Safer by far. But some nights... I wake up in a cold sweat, smelling that swamp rot, and see those green eyes staring at me from the darkness. The Mikasuki legends. Maybe they're more than just old stories. Maybe there are things out there in the deep swamp. Things that have been watching us longer than we've been watching them. Things best left undisturbed. Things that will snatch you up without a second thought. It happened a few years ago, down in the Big Cypress. I reckon most folks haven't heard of it. The Everglades get all the attention. But for me, the quiet of the Cypress is almost scarier, the way the sawgrass stretches on forever, a hundred shades of green hiding God knows what. 
I'm Damien, by the way, was a fishing guide and knew the swamp like my backyard, or so I thought. Funny thing was, that trip started like any other. I had a couple of out-of-towners on my boat, father and son pair eager for an authentic Florida fishing experience. Don't get me wrong, I love taking folks out. Sure, some are clueless city slickers, but seeing their faces light up at their first base catch, that never gets old. We were up a narrow tributary, so thick with trees the sun filtered through in patches. It was midday, hot and sticky. I had them cast where the water deepened, shaded by a tangle of cypress roots, mostly small stuff biting, which was good enough for them. They were having fun. Then, that thick, humid air split with a scream. Not human, not any animal I'd ever heard. It raised the hair on my arms, echoed across the still water, then just cut off, swallowed by the silence. The dad looked at me, eyes wide. The son, what was his name, Mark? He grinned. Sounds like Bigfoot, he joked. I tried to laugh, but it came out weak. I'm no scaredy cat, but a wrong sound can turn a friendly place into something alien, you know? We kept fishing, quiet-like, but the whole vibe had shifted. And then, the dad got a snag. Now, snags in the swamp are a curse. You get hung up on roots, logs, any kind of junk the water hides. This snag was bad. The line going taut like it was hooked into a freight train. The dad pulled and swore, trying to get some slack. That's when it moved. Whatever was on the other end of the line, it moved with a strength that had nothing to do with snags. The rod almost got yanked out of the dad's hands, the boat giving a violent jerk. He staggered, braced himself, and yelled for Mark to cut the line. But Mark, kid was all excited, yelling, It's a monster! Reel it in! The dad swore again, frantically reeling, the drag on his reel screaming. Then the line snapped, the tension gone in an instant. They both stumbled, and I had to grab the boat's side to keep it steady. We were all breathing hard, looking out at the spot where the line broke. The water was still, no ripples, no sign of what had been down there. After that, the trip was ruined. Not that they blamed me, but the mood was gone. We headed back to the dock, the quiet only broken by the hum of the motor. Next morning, I couldn't shake the feeling I had to get back out there. It wasn't about bravery or stupidity, just a bone-deep certainty that I needed to see what I'd brushed up against the day before. Nobody in their right mind goes out alone to places like that, but, well, I've never been accused of having too much sense. It was just past dawn when I set off. Mist clung to the water, and the air was still damp with night. I moved the boat slow, my eyes scanning the shoreline, not really expecting anything, just going through the motions. And then, I saw it. At first, I thought it was a gator, a big one, sunning itself on some half-sunken logs. But as I got closer, something seemed wrong about the shape, too lanky, too many jagged angles. Then it turned. Its head was like something from a bad dream. Long, narrow snout and those eyes? No reflection, just flat black staring right at me. It moved off the log into the water, not with a gator's slide, but by unfurling itself, standing tall. And that's when I saw its legs, thin and spindly as spiders, propelling it across the water with unnatural speed. I don't remember much after that. Getting my motor started, the roar of it echoing as I spun the boat around and gunned it downriver. It followed for a while, easily keeping pace, that triangular head peering above the sawgrass. I made it back to the main channel, back to civilization. Never told a soul, not till now. They'd think I was sun-touched, or worse, that I was lying for attention. But some things you just don't forget. Word reached me about a month later. A solo fisherman disappeared up that same tributary. Boat found abandoned, but no sign of him. They dragged the water, searched for days, found nothing. There's stories the old-timers tell, 
Stories about something tall and hungry that walks with the shadows in the swamp. Swamp boogeyman stuff, they say. But I ain't sure it's just stories anymore. Let the tourists have their gators. Out beyond those boardwalks, there's places the sun don't quite reach, and things older than names waiting in the green silence. Locals call it the skunk ape, thinking it's some overgrown primate, but I reckon it's something far worse than that. It happened a few years back, maybe longer. Honestly, time gets blurry when you're running for your life. I'm Wes, Wesley Ford, used to be a regular guy, college student with big dreams and a fondness for fishing trips off the beaten path. That's the thing, see? That's how it gets you. This trip, we were deep in the Everglades, way down south around Shark River Slough, rented a classic little flat-bottom boat, one of those with the big fan at the back. Figured we'd explore some of the smaller canals, spot some gators, maybe even wrestle a python if we were feeling extra ambitious. First day went smooth, weather was fine, beers were flowing, and the only wildlife we saw were skittering lizards and a heron with a bad attitude. We found a spot to camp on one of the bigger islands, made a fire, told those slightly too tall tales you tell under the stars, the usual. It was dawn that things got wrong. There's a particular kind of quiet out there. It's not silent, exactly. There's always something rustling, buzzing, croaking. But that morning, even the bugs held their breath. Something shifted in the air. A prickle on the back of my neck, the way you might feel just before lightning strikes. We dismissed it, though. Chalked it up to nerves. Too much campfire talk spooking us. Around midday is when we first saw it. Not the whole thing, mind you, just a glimpse. We were idling through a narrow channel. The mangrove roots like gnarled fingers dipped in the water. A flicker of movement on the bank, and suddenly this head pops up. Now, I've seen gators, big ones. But this was different. This head was huge, misshapen, like a log with too many knots. Its eyes were big, yellow, set too far apart. And the smell, like rotted leaves and swamp mud with a hint of something worse. Something wrong. My buddies, bless their brave but foolish hearts, figured it was another monster python. Florida's full of invasives, right? They were chattering about catching it, making headlines. Me? I knew in my gut, whatever that was. It wasn't natural. We didn't get a good look. The thing slid back into the brush, just a splash, and then nothing. We convinced ourselves it was our imaginations playing tricks, but the mood of the trip had changed. Night was when it started hunting. We heard it first, circling the camp. Not footsteps exactly, but heavy thuds, followed by the rustling of branches, that awful smell getting closer. Then came the screams. Not from us, at least not at first. It sounded distant, carried on the damp night air, cut off abruptly like a slam door. We huddled in the tent, whispering dumb plans about making a run for the boat. But there was nowhere to go on those narrow islands. Whatever was out there, it knew it. Time stretched, each rustle of leaves feeling like a countdown. Just before dawn it rushed the camp. I saw its full form for the first time as it crashed through the flimsy tent. It was huge, easily seven feet tall even hunched over. Its skin was dark, rough like bark, and its arms, one was way too long, ended in a set of claws that could have gutted a man with ease. It snatched Bennett up like a doll. There was a blur of motion, a scream that died mid-word, and then just the crunching in the dark. I ran. Blind panic, splashing through water, branches smacking me. Behind me, I heard another splash, then silence. Don't know if it caught Ryan or if he made it to the boat. Didn't much matter by then. I stumbled into the main canal, found the boat half-swamped. 
Got the engine started somehow and roared off. Didn't matter where, just away. I ran until I saw signs of civilization, a little fishing village with scared folks and concerned cops. Didn't tell them the whole truth, of course. Sounded crazy then. Still sounds crazy now. Mumbled about animal attacks. Pythons gone rogue. They searched the area, found nothing. Just the ripped up tent. Some blood stains that didn't add up. Ever since, life's felt kinda hollow. Got a desk job, a city apartment. Tell myself I'm safe among concrete and traffic. But some nights, I hear that rustling sound again. See those yellow eyes in the shadows. Smell that rotting swamp smell. I know it's out there, waiting. Maybe not for me. Not anymore. But for some other fool who thinks he's exploring the wild. Folks who don't realize the wild can just as easily explore you back. Some stories say there's a creature out there in the swamps. A skunk ape, they call it. Never paid them much mind before. Now? Well, stranger things have happened. And sometimes the old legends, they're truer than we'd like to admit. The news reports came a few days later. Some hikers up north, closer to the Tamiami Trail, had gone missing. Search parties found, well, they didn't find much. Ripped clothing, blood splatters, same kind of inconclusive mess as our campsite. Papers started whispering about animal attacks again, but some of the seasoned park rangers, they exchanged glances nobody else saw. I started doing some digging, quiet-like. Turns out, there's a whole history of strange sightings around the glades. Disappearances that get written off, glimpses locals don't like to talk about. Old-timers spinning stories about a creature lurking in the shadows. A thing that's part man and part swamp. Don't know what I believe now. Part of me is relieved in a twisted way. Better a monster, even an unknown one, than the gnawing doubt that it was all in my head. That I broke under the pressure, lost my friends over shadows and fear. But the other part, the part that still wakes me up in a cold sweat, it knows the truth. There's something out there in those swamps, something old and hungry and cunning. It wears the shape of the wild, hides in the mud and tangled roots, and every so often it remembers that we're made of meat, that it's been far too long since the last feast. It happened a few years back, just after getting out of college, when that wild recklessness of youth still buzzed in my veins. The Everglades. They sounded so much more exciting than some cubicle job. My name's Ryland, by the way, not that it really matters now. I rolled into a little town just outside the Big Cypress National Preserve, the kind of place where everyone at the gas station knows each other by name. I mentioned my fascination with the swamps to the old guy behind the register and his eyes lit up. You want to see the real glades? I know a guy. Runs tours, he said, a mischievous glint in his eye. Turns out his guy was his niece's husband. The dude, a wiry Cajun named Thibodeau, looked more like a swamp creature himself than a tour guide, but he had a flat-bottomed boat with a rusting air fan, and I had that itch for adventure. So off we went. The Everglades were exactly how I'd imagined them. Oppressive humidity, buzzing insects, the smell of stagnant water and rotting vegetation. Thibodeau knew every little twist and turn, taking us down channels lined with mangroves so thick the sun rarely pierced through. Hours later, we reached a clearing, an island of sorts. Used to be an old Seminole camp, Thibodeau said, switching off the motor. They say things got left behind here. I could see the glint of treasure hunter excitement in his eyes. We pulled the boat ashore. He led me into the jungle-choked heart of the island and that's when I saw the bones. At first, I figured they were animal. Florida has panthers, gators big enough to swallow a man whole. But something was off. The bones looked too big. Some were cracked and splintered. As we stumbled deeper into the tangle of vines, the bones got more numerous. Fragments of skulls, rib cages half buried in the mud. 
Finally, we found it. The source. A corpse lay sprawled beneath a massive oak tree. Clothing rotted away to scraps. Flesh picked clean. I recoiled. Thibodeau grinned, a flash of white teeth against his tanned, leathery skin. The thrill of the macabre danced in his eyes. Let's see what else we can find, he said, and my stomach churned with disgust. Thibodeau knelt by the skeleton, started poking around with a grimy finger. My eyes fell on a glint in the grass, half a broken necklace, a silver arrowhead charm dangling from the chain. Someone had been wearing that right up until... A sense of wrongness prickled along my spine. I opened my mouth to say we should leave, but the words never came. A growl, low and guttural, echoed through the trees. We both froze. Just a gator, Thibodeau muttered, but his voice lacked conviction. He reached into his pack and pulled out a shotgun. Another growl, louder, closer this time. And then it burst from the trees. A blur of dirty, matted fur and bared teeth. It was twice the size of any dog, more wolf-like, but with clawed feet too large, limbs too long and powerful. Its mouth hung open, too wide for its skull as if something had forced it apart, filled with rows of jagged, blood-stained teeth. Its eyes, those eyes glowed with a yellow light, like embers in the dim green gloom. Thibodeau fired. The blast roared through the clearing. The creature stumbled, more in surprise than actual hurt. Then it snarled, an unearthly sound, and lunged again. Run! Thibodeau yelled. We didn't need to be told twice. Panic propelled us through the undergrowth, branches whipping at our faces, thorns tearing at our skin. I could hear the creature behind us, its snarls and the snapping of branches as it barreled through the foliage. We burst back out onto the shore. The boat was a sanctuary. We leaped in, Thibodeau fumbling with the motor while I shoved us off from the bank with a ragged tree branch. The creature exploded from the tree line, skidding to a halt at the water's edge. It paced back and forth along the shore, eyes burning with fury as the boat drifted out with the current. Thibodeau finally coaxed the air fan to life, and we shot off down the channel. I risked a glance back. The creature was watching us, its silhouette stark against the backdrop of the island. We didn't speak for hours, the only sound the rhythmic chugging of the motor and the buzzing of insects. The sun was setting by the time we reached the dock. Stumbling ashore, I barely managed a mumbled thank you to Thibodeau before bolting to my rental car and peeling out of that little town. I tried to put it behind me, the bones, the creature, that impossible feeling of being hunted. But there are nights I wake in a cold sweat, hearing the rustling of leaves outside my window, seeing those monstrous glowing eyes in the darkness. I convinced myself it was just an animal, something undiscovered maybe. Then I did some digging. Old local legends whispered of something called a Rougarou, a twisted spirit, they say, born from desperation and hunger that roam the swamps preying on the lost. Sounds like superstitious nonsense, right? But when I remember that shattered skeleton beneath the oak and the gleam of those hungry eyes, the stories don't seem so ridiculous anymore. I never went back to the Everglades, took up bird watching instead figured those fuzzy little creatures were a lot less likely to eat me. Still, my nightmares didn't fade completely. Sometimes, when a dog barks in the distance, the sound morphs in my mind into a guttural snarl, and I check my windows, the locks on my doors, just to be sure. A year or so after my little swamp adventure, I stumbled across a faded newspaper clipping online. A couple went missing deep in Big Cypress. Their mangled canoe was found washed up on a muddy bank, and search parties combed the area for weeks. No bodies were ever recovered. The article didn't name the beast of folklore, but I didn't need it spelled out for me. That island in the heart of the swamp, the place where we found the bones. I'm convinced now there's more to those old legends than just tall tales. Some things in this world are best left undisturbed left to the shadows and the places sunlight struggles to reach. Every so often, 
when the humidity hangs thick in the air and the sounds of the city fade, I swear I can smell that rotten earth scent of the swamp again. And part of me, that reckless adventurous part, remembers the thrill mixed in with the horror. Maybe that's the worst part, knowing, if given the chance, I might take that boat right back into the heart of darkness. It happened three, maybe four years ago, back when I thought escaping from city life was as simple as a change of scenery. Name's Finn, by the way. Finn Dalton. Average guy, average job, average life that got too damn suffocating until the Everglades seemed like a breath of fresh, wild air. I headed south, a road map, and a vague notion of adventure my only guides. Turned off the highway down into the Big Cypress National Preserve, following a winding dirt road so narrow the branches of towering cypresses scraped against the rental car. It was a rental because my piece of junk sedan never would have survived the pothole-ridden, overgrown route. Seemed smarter to risk a few dings on a car I wasn't attached to. The sun was beginning its descent when I spotted a break in the trees to my left. No signs. No official trailhead. Just a strip of worn earth disappearing into the dense tangle of mangroves and sawgrass. Figured it might lead to a hidden swimming hole or an old fishing spot. Impulsiveness had always been my downfall. The path was barely wide enough for a single person, and it twisted back on itself, forcing me to duck beneath hanging vines and clamber over exposed roots slick with mud. The air thickened with each step, heavy and still, punctuated by the whine of mosquitoes. They swarmed in relentless clouds, leaving my arms and face covered in itchy welts no matter how wildly I swiped at them. It felt like hours had passed when the path opened out into a small clearing. In the center, a structure loomed, less cabin and more like a makeshift shelter pieced together from weathered planks and rusted scraps of corrugated metal. It leaned at an impossible angle, propped against an enormous cypress tree that seemed to be swallowing the hut hole. Now, I'd read enough survival guides to know turning back was the smart option but exhaustion and a stubborn streak battled it out, and stubbornness had a way of winning. As I approached, a figure emerged from the darkness of the doorway. He was tall. No, unnaturally tall. His gangly limbs moved with a strange, jerky stiffness, and he wore what looked like a tattered scarecrow outfit, complete with a battered straw hat that shadowed his face. Every instinct screamed at me to run, Lost, are you? The man's voice was like a rusty hinge, painful to the ears. Just exploring. My voice came out as a croak. I took a hesitant step back. I noticed a pile of old tires rotting next to the hut, and a glint of something white peeked out from under a stained tarp near the tree. Exploring turns to going missing awful quick in the swamps, the figure rasped. Lots of ways a man can become a memory out here. The hairs on the back of my neck stood on end, but I forced a laugh. Don't worry, I'll stick to the marked trails. There ain't no trails to follow you back, he said. These swamps have their own paths, their own appetites. That's when the glint of light near the tree caught my eye again. Beside the hut, the tarp shifted and groaned, and a human skull rolled free peeking through the weathered fabric. The man gestured towards it, a bony hand reaching out from beneath a ripped sleeve. Bones tell tales you won't find in no guidebook, he rasped. His voice dripped with an unsettling amusement. They tell of creatures hidden so deep, even the gators fear their names. Terror gripped me, a coldness far deeper than any swamp water could reach. I broke then, turned, and scrambled back the way I had come, swatting at branches and stumbling blindly over roots. All the while, I could hear him chuckling behind me, that harsh, rasping sound echoing through the dusk. Suddenly, he was in front of me, blocking the path. He'd moved without a sound, with an inhuman swiftness. Moonlight gleamed on a wickedly curved blade clutched in his hand, 
the edge smeared with a dark, sticky substance that my brain refused to identify. He leaned in, tilting his head the way a bird might, considering an insect. And then, he screamed. The sound tore through the twilight, a shriek so piercing it made my ears ring. I clapped my hands over them, but still it pierced the swamp's stillness. Panic propelled me forward. I knocked him aside and stumbled past, fleeing as he shrieked again and again, the sound fading behind me into the oppressive silence of the swamp. I found my way back to the rental car somehow, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm against my ribs. The drive back to civilization was a blur. Every shadow, every rustle seemed to conceal some new horror. When I finally stumbled into my tiny apartment, locking every door and window, felt like a pathetic defense against what I'd seen out there. The story seemed too crazy, too unbelievable even to me. Cops gave me the pitying looks reserved for lunatics or addicts, but no leads ever panned out. The hut, the man, they'd vanished like swamp mist. I went back a few months later, armed with survival gear and a hunting rifle that probably would have done jack against whatever that thing was. I never found the trailhead again. Sometimes, I wonder if it was all a hallucination, exhaustion twisting reality, but the memory of that blade, that skull, it lingers, as vivid as the day it happened. That's when I started talking to myself. Not the mumbling kind, but full conversations. Checking in with another person, even if that person was my own reflection. It was the only way to cling to sanity, to not get completely lost in the echoes of those screams. Years have passed, but the Everglades still haunt my dreams. And in the lonely hours, when the city noise subsides, I sometimes hear it. A distant, rasping cry that cuts through the quiet like a blade. That's when I lock every window and double-check the door, because fear has a way of finding you, even in the steel and concrete jungle. The wildlife folks say it's panthers making odd calls, or some undiscovered bird. Maybe so. But the locals, the ones whose families have lived on the swamp's edge for generations, they sometimes mutter of the skunk ape. They share whispered stories of strange figures fading into the shadows, disappearances blamed on rogue gators or boat accidents. And I know they see something in my eyes, a flicker of recognition that separates me from the tourists and thrill-seekers. The other day, a report flashed across the local news. A missing hiker, last seen near the Big Cypress. And in the grainy footage, I swore I caught a glimpse of something impossibly tall slipping beneath the cypress canopy. The screen went black, but those rasping screams, they never truly fade away. They say there's a beauty to the swamp, a hidden world those of us in cities can't fathom. Maybe there is, but there's a darkness too, an old lurking hunger that can sink its claws into you. And once it's tasted fear, well that scent lingers long after the sun has set. <laughs>